transmission has been radically improved electronically. Using a large movable radar pod on its side, it is now the first advanced surveillance and control helicopter in the world. The avionics have been completely upgraded, so the radar is new. It's a very powerful radar, and in addition to that, it's got state-of-the-art data link, which is basically real-time information relay to anybody within the uh, theatre of operations. It's a massive leap for the Navy. The main thing is we've moved away from a single role of AW to airborne surveillance and control, which means the carrier can take away this platform with them and carry out complete battle space management, control of aircraft, ships and land forces in one platform. The radar antenna is housed in a movable pod under the Sea King. What makes the Mark 7 Sea King so special is that it can actually process three different radar modes at the same time. This means it can relay information between sea, air, and overland contacts and control all those areas of operation instantaneously, while at the same time sending the data back to its ship on a new fast digital connection known as Link 16. And the platforms that are used in that role are normally large fixed wings with a dozen or so crew. And the beauty of this is that we can stick this on an aircraft carrier with three crew and provide pretty much the same service. Although the equipment was very new to the crews of 849 Squadron, while working alongside the Americans in Gulf War II, they produced some spectacular results that were crucial to the Allied campaign. In Gulf War II, Mark 7 played a vital role, not only for our own forces, uh, but the Link 16 enabled it to integrate with the Americans and also our troops on the ground as well. So we were able to relay that information instantaneously to them. 150-270-1-5-0. As advanced as the Mark 7 is, there is still room for further development on the helicopter. One area that we still need to address is exactly that, our own self-defense. Uh, we're looking at various systems at the moment that will provide our aircraft with its own defense aid suite. So at the moment, we are heavily reliant on other forces actually protecting our aircraft. But the performance of the Mark 7 has been so impressive that new capabilities are being discovered almost daily. There's still an awful lot to learn. I mean, we've only had it really uh, front line for just over a year. Uh, so we're learning things all the time. I mean, the, the Gulf War was a massive learning curve for us, and, and that's, that's continuing. As well as the Mark 7, the Royal Navy has developed the most modern combat helicopter in service anywhere. This is the Merlin. It's the first combat helicopter to be developed by the Royal Navy in 25 years. It's a quantum leap forward in technology for the United Kingdom. It's a fantastic aircraft to fly, very, very maneuverable. I mean, given the size of it, um, it's particularly maneuverable. Um, I've flown five or six different types of helicopters now, but this is certainly my favourite. There's a lot of power. The Rolls-Royce engines produce a lot of power for the aircraft, and uh, it's real fun to fly. The Merlin is without doubt the most advanced in-service helicopter in the world today. Uh, it's got a fantastic avionics suite, three engines, redundancy in almost every system. But also there, we can stay out for longer by shutting one of the engines down in flight, um, which makes our endurance uh, particularly good, up to four and a half to five hours with one engine shut down. The Merlin has two main roles in combat, anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare. We can carry four Stingray torpedoes, four Mark II depth chargers, or a variety of GPMG, general purpose machine guns, which we can mount in the cabin door and the windows. The radar is very powerful, and it's what we call a pulse compression radar. So what it does is send a very powerful pulse out a long distance, and we can track contacts up to 160 miles away. What the radar also does is automatically track those contacts for us and give us the tracking and time information, which again can be transmitted on the data link back to the surface units. 
on the six LCD displays, we have all the information from the sensors, which are displayed in a variety of colours. For example, the hostiles we can display as red, the friendlies we can display as green, and those colour displays are sent to the ship. So straight away, when that comes through on Datalink, the ship knows whether we think it's a hostile or a friendly unit. Because the Merlin is fully digital, it is easy to run simulated missions. There is a dedicated Merlin training building, which houses four simulators, all of which can be linked from one main control room. This allows the crew to practice all types of missions in a safe environment. All this high technology and promise of a future digital battlefield to be viewed and fought on computer screens makes war begin to sound like one giant video game. But what would such a game look like? There is a possibility to glimpse this future at an army base in Alabama. At Fort Rucker, they're training officers and pilots to fight wars on a super simulator called the Cav Sim. In this mock HQ, commanders are learning how to fight today's battles with their troops and helicopters. They are in communication with their pilots flying eight simulated helicopters. Each cubicle can be configured to provide any helicopter needed for the exercise. But yeah, stay behind that ridge line. Crowd north, vicinity, garage check. Increase from 24 right to now, not hostile. Break. Break. Here in master control, also known as the stealth mode, room, the control room, 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 control room, 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 instructors play God, managing the battle as well as controlling the enemy. In charge is Captain Dan Knott. The commander tracks the battle using post-it notes on a regular map and butcher blocks or a piece of paper just to write things down. From there, they translate it up to me via the radios to where I can then see what's going on in their eyes. Whereas in reality, I'm watching a computer screen that tells me exactly where everybody is and how the computer links in the enemy and the friendly and the aircraft. And I can see the big picture, much like what you're going to have in a few years, where everything is tracked, all the vehicles, we know exactly where they are, we know exactly where the enemy is. Recommendation for extraction. They can see everything. A true vision of how battles will be fought in the future. My position marked with yellow smoke. It is very similar to a video game, and I tease my my children and my wife on a daily basis that that's what I do all day is play video games. Roger, just got a call from Eagle Five. Uh, what he wants to do, break. You've got to get his ground elements. But out the video of the game is becoming reality. In West Palm Beach, Florida, it's the dawn of a new age for warfare, the digital age. In a research facility in southern Florida, the world's first helicopter conceived and designed to be totally digital is under test. Called the Comanche, it is scheduled to be in service in 2009. Everything from detection systems to flight controls have been created to work in the digital battlefield. This aircraft is the culmination of everything that has gone before and can truly be called the ultimate combat helicopter. Head of the project, Colonel Bob Birmingham, has watched the program develop over many years. This is aircraft number two. It's our second Comanche prototype. We've had a very successful flight test program and this has been a major part of it. On the front end, we have recently integrated our electrical optical sensor system, and then very soon in the future, we're going to be able to design in our laser warning receiver and our radar warning receiver on the front end of this. The 